You're not supposed to have a favorite when you're doing a film festival. We have so many events, so many evenings, but this is my favorite evening of the entire festival. So you're in the right place at the right time. And to make it even more special than ever before, I have a very special surprise tonight. Um, and we're honored to have Scott George and the Osage Tribal Singers from, from Killers of the Flower Moon. They will be performing their Oscar-nominated best original song, Washashe, a song for my people. So please welcome. Give it Scott George and the Osage Tribal Singers from Killers of the Flower Moon. 
Thank you. As I mentioned, this is my favorite evening of the whole film festival. You guys are going to be in incredible hands with your host, um, my incredible good friend, Dave Carger. He is the Turner Classic Movies host. And he's also, he just published this most amazing, delicious book, Oscar Nights, Iconic Stars and Filmmakers on Their Career Defining Wins. Anybody who's out there who is a cinephile and who's an Oscar lover needs to have this book in their hands. So go out there and get this. Uh, please welcome my dear good friend, and he is super hot. He's. <laughs> please welcome Dave Carger. Thank you so much. I mean, I didn't think I was going to get like a book promo out of this, too. 50 Oscar nights, 50 Oscar nights. Available anywhere good books are sold. I think it would look good on all your coffee tables. Um, thank you, Roger. Thank you to the Manitou Fund. Thank you to the board of directors of the Santa Barbara International Film Festival for having me back to host the Virtuosos Awards for my 14th consecutive year. And not just because I'm here in front of this year's group, I really do think this is probably the most impressive and accomplished group that we've ever, Roger and I, put together. Just to give you an idea, um, in our group of eight, we have two Emmy winners, America Ferreira and Coleman Domingo. Two Gotham Award winners, Charles Melton and Lily Gladstone. A Grammy Award winner, Danielle Brooks. Two Critics' Choice Awards winners, Dave I Enjoy Randolph and Greta Lee. And a man who has won a BAFTA and two Olivier Awards, Andrew Scott. And I also have to tell you, that after Roger and I finished assembling this list of eight and had everybody confirmed, it was then that I realized that all eight of our virtuoso honorees this year are either performers of color or members of the LGBTQ plus community or both. In other words, you are not gonna see one straight white person on stage all night long. Now, I have nothing against straight white people. If it wasn't for straight white people, I would not be here. Shout out to my mom and dad in the 10th row. But that's not what tonight is about. Last night was fabulous. Leonard Malton, Robert Downey Jr., Killian Murphy, Rob Lowe, straight white male bonanza. <laughs> not tonight. No, seriously, I, I'm just so happy with this group and, I, and I'm thrilled that this is a sold out event. So before we get started, if anyone's at this event for the first time, the way this works is I'm gonna bring the other six honorees out one at a time. We're gonna show a clip from their movie. I'm gonna do a quick interview with them. And then I bring them all out together and things get a little bit silly. So before we start, Mike McGee, our fabulous uh, montage editor, has put together a montage, which I'm very excited to see, of the work of our virtuoso honorees. Let's take a look. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. I can see nobody because the <laughs> lights are so bright. I can see you guys and then it's like nothing. There's a lot of people. So obviously you performed that monologue many times. What was it like when you saw it on a big screen for the first time? Did it come through as you imagined it would when you performed it? Um, it was terrible to watch. Um, 
you, you know, has anyone here ever had to listen to their voice on a voicemail? <laughs> it's like that, like, you know, um, yeah, it took me, I don't know, like three times of just like watching the movie to get my own like critic voice in my head who was like, why did you do that thing with your face? I'm like, Ugh, why do you keep doing that? Um, you know, the first time that I could really hear the words was at the LA premiere. I took my children with me. Um, I have a five-year-old son and a three-year-old daughter. And my three-year-old daughter sat on my lap the whole time. And um, it, it just like, it really kept me like in my body and it kept me like in the room. And it was a premiere, so there was like a couple thousand people who were all really psyched to watch the movie. So it was like a very friendly audience. And it was something about having my daughter, who was only three, watch this. I kept trying to like imagine what does she see? What is she hearing, right? And it was like, I finally got to like hear the words for the first time, it felt like, and like really feel them. And so that was moving and I, you know, it was so deep for me. And at the end of the day, my daughter turns to me and says, why were you driving that car? <laughs> and I'm like, awesome, I'm so glad that's what you took from that. <laughs> which is slightly better than what my son said two weeks later, which he had said nothing about the movie, and then two weeks later he goes, Mom, did the construction workers ever finish building that wall? <laughs> and I'm like, your mother was in a movie, and nobody cares. Anyway, kids will humble you, it's wonderful. It's like when you spend all the money to give a kid a, a Christmas gift and all they care about is the is box. the box, right. of course, so always. So there's that. Yeah. So assuming, I hope I'm not wrong here, assuming you were sent this script of, for Barbie with an offer, like you, this was, the role was yours, what was it then like knowing you were probably gonna play it to read through the script and see that monologue? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's like the thing that you never imagine is gonna happen, that some fabulous visionary auteur director is gonna come, you know, come texting saying, hey, I wrote a movie and we wrote this part with your voice in our heads. Um, it's Barbie, hear me out. <laughs> um, and I was like, okay. Um, and, and she said from the beginning, she's like, it's weird and it's bonkers, but read it. And, and we wrote Gloria with your voice in our head. And so, I mean, from page one, it was like the most incredible delight. It was, it was, you know, I mean, it was like watching it. It was so unexpected and, you know, Greta and Noah's vision were just so singular and it was subvert. I mean, it's the Barbie movie that no one asked for, right? No one asked for this movie. No one knew we needed this movie, but clearly we needed this movie, right? And um, it was just um, an incredible delight. And I remember, I remember the very moment um, in the script where Gloria realizes that Barbie came for her. And I remember having that almost like in this meta, meta way feeling of reading the script and being like, oh, this movie's about us. Like, this movie's for me. Like, it, like, I just felt like as an adult grown woman, what an incredible Christmas gift to unwrap that like a fun, fantastic, adventurous movie that centers joy is like, about an adult grown human woman's perspective on the world. And that, you know, it was such a surprise and we don't, we don't get that often. So I think even aside from having been asked to be in it, I was just so kind of thrilled that this was the version of the Barbie movie that we were gonna get as a culture, you know? Yes. What has it then been like for you to see this monologue expand beyond the film? Jane Fonda quoting it, Kevin Costner doing a fun <laughs> bit at the Golden Globes where he's reciting it. It's taken on a life even bigger than the movie. What's that been like? I mean, you know, I just, I'm so glad I didn't F it up, you know? Like, I, 
I read, I read the monologue and was like, and also Greta did something really mean, which was when she told me about the script, she said, there's a monologue. I call it Gloria's aria. And Meryl Streep said, she would like to do a monologue like this. And I was like, that is the meanest thing you could have said to me. I was like, then give it to Meryl Streep. Why are you, why are you even putting me in this position? And, um, and so there was a little bit of pressure around it. I was a little nervous. Um, and I really did just feel like the words hit me as truth. And I just really felt like I don't want to stand in the way of this beautiful writing achieving, you know, the articulation of something that feels so true for so many people, you know? And, and I, I, you know, I feel so, um, so lucky that I got to be the actor to bring it through, and I feel truly happy that I, I didn't get in the way of it, and, and that, you know, possibly I was a part of why it works, and, um, and but what I feel more than anything, when I hear from men and women and people of all genders and ages and sizes and backgrounds and who resonate with it, even if it's not for them, but they hear those words and then it makes them think of their mothers, their sisters, their daughters, people that they love in a different way. Like, what I, what I feel is that it needed to be brought into the culture. And I feel so grateful that I got to be a part of doing that. So 17 years ago, you won a primetime Emmy for Best Actress for Ugly Betty. That's right. In the 17 years since, was Oscar nomination on the list of dreams? I mean, Oscar nomination has been on the list of dreams since I was like five. So yes, let's not... You know, let's not pretend like I haven't practiced that speech a couple times. Um, you know, let's just be honest. Um, it's so surreal. I mean, I, yeah, I've wanted, I've, I, I've wanted to be an actress since I was five years old, and I watched my sister begrudgingly be flying monkey number two in her fifth grade play. And I sat there and I just kind of burned with rage that nobody had asked me to be a flying monkey. <laughs> and, and, you know, and the memories of like watching Halle Berry win her Academy Award, like they're just like seared in you as a kid growing up <laughs> with an insane dream that nobody sees as possible, much less likely for you, you know, to, to have a feeling that one day you might get to be a part of something like that or be in that room. I mean, it's been an incredibly surreal couple weeks to try to reconcile what I'm living right now with, with that kid, you know, and that girl. And it's a it's a beautiful moment, and um, it almost feels like time traveling. Like sometimes I'm her, and sometimes I'm me, and um, and um, you know, I, I it's it's hard to really wrap my mind around. It's it is a dream come true, and uh, yeah, that's all there is to say about that. Well, it's very well deserved. So happy to have you here, America Ferrera, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can stay. All right, we're going to inch our way through the alphabet. Coming up next, Andrew Scott. Before he comes out, let's look at a clip from All of Us Strangers. <laughs> Welcome. Oh, I'm matching the chair. <laughs> yes, you're going to blend right in. Yeah. It's very cozy, very comfy. Yeah. Andrew, Hi. I, welcome. Thank it's you. It's great to see you. We've only seen each other on Zoom, so this is, this yeah. is fun for me. You know, I'd be very curious to know, now that this movie has been out for a while, what do people want to say to you when they've seen it and they see you? And particularly here in this country, what do people want to say? 
What's so extraordinary about the film is uh, it's been out here for a good wee while, but it's just come out in, in uh, the UK and Ireland. And so it's sort of, it's taken off. The film is just sort of, the flight has taken off. So it's lovely that it's out in the world. But what's so extraordinary is um, people say, do you know what line in that film killed me? And you're like, yeah. And they say, and it's always something completely different. Um, I, and I think it's a, it's a testament to the movie, actually, because there's so many bits in the movie that are so, are so devastating to people and uh, people see themselves in whether they're parents or uh, you know whether they're grief stricken in some way and that you know I always the film is a little bit about about grief but grief doesn't necessarily manifest itself just when somebody dies it can be grief about a relationship or whatever so I think it just I've never really had it with, with a film before, and, or even with theatre in, in that sense, where it just has such a broad spect spectrum of um, reaction to it, and uh, so many different people reacting to it in a different way. So it's completely wonderful. I mean, no movie moved me more than this, this, this last year, without a doubt. Okay, so what, <laughs> what, line, what line kills you? It's, it's, um, it's one of Paul Maskell's lines, actually. Because I find it re oh Jesus, I was about to say I find it difficult to watch myself, and then like, <laughs> <laughs> then Godzilla and White up there appears. <laughs> uh, uh, it's one of Paul's lines. It's when he, he he I don't know. There's just something that so beautiful about uh, Paul's performance in in that, uh, and he just talks about how easy it is to lose himself, and it's just the sort of um, empathy in his in his. Uh, in his eyes. I think the film is so incredibly compassionate, you know? It's really tender and so raw, and uh, I think that's why it kills people so much. Um, is there people, is there a thing, we don't want to say too much for like the three of you who might not have seen the movie yet, but are there questions that pop up a lot that people ask you when they've seen it? What, what's come up most? Well, there's a sort of twist in the, in, in the, <laughs> in the film, but... It's, it's a strange film. It's sort of a little bit like a dream. And so people, I mean, there's a sort of a, uh, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to call it a plot twist, but there is a sort of twist at the end. But I always, for those of you who haven't seen it, or, or those of you even who ha have seen it, people sort of want to get the, get the answer right. Have I got this right? But I always equate it to like a dream. You know, sometimes when you wake up from a dream and you can feel really desolate or you can wake up laughing or you can there's so many different reactions and you don't necessarily look to the dream for logic you just you just accept the the strong feeling and, and, and that's what i would say to people you know that it's just it's whatever you kind of want it to be um yeah. i like that i know that one of the things that you are most proud of in relation to this movie is the beauty and the specificity of the intimate scenes between you and paul mescal and they add so much to the movie, they're gorgeous. What was it like for you to be so bare, not only physically, but emotionally? Was that exciting as a concept, or was it frightening, or a combination? <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't know, it's really interesting about sex scenes. I think it's really important. We were very, we were very protected, you know, with the rise of intimacy coordinators, I really, um, really welcome it because it makes you feel safe. And actually, it means that you're able to have a conversation um, where you're able to express your fears a little bit. And actually, it allows you to be a bit more daring in some way because you feel like, frankly, if, if, you, if you don't like it, it won't end up in the movie if you feel uncomfortable. And so that allows you to just be a bit more free rather than like, oh, I don't want to um, show this side of myself. But you know, what I, while that was important that we got those scenes right. I think what was really wonderful about our director was he was like, it is just another scene. Mm. And sex is just physical communication. It's, it's a way of communicating. It's, it's physical communication rather than verbal communication. So you have to sort of um, improvise in that sense and you have to sort of listen, but you just have to listen with your body. And I'm very, very proud of those, um, those scenes because I think they tell the story very well. And I think it's, it's beautiful. And actually what I think is so radical about the film isn't necessarily the sex scenes, but the scenes that are around the sex scenes. And I think sort of tenderness between uh, two men particularly, I think, is radical. Because I think there are certain um, f uh, prejudiced uh, factions of the community who can understand sexuality, but what they find challenging mm. 
is actually tenderness between two male characters, and I think that's important that that's uh, represented in that way because, um, you know, our vulnerability is our is our is our greatest power. I saw you recent. Yes. <clears throat> I saw you recently on Graham Norton's show, and you kind of joked around that like you didn't want to be in the room when your mom and dad watched this. Movie. Nobody, so, nobody wants that. So have they now seen it? What? Have they seen it now? I don't know. I don't, I don't speak with them anymore. No, no, I'm joking. <laughs> I don't know. Like they, they, ha they have seen it. Yes, they have seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they didn't yeah. have any specific questions for you, right? <laughs> Do you have some particular oh, questions no. for me? <laughs> I've already asked. Um, I, I do, I do. I would love for this audience to hear a little bit about the behind the scenes. For those of you who have seen the movie, there's this beautiful scene where Andrew gets in bed with Claire Foy and Jamie Bell, who play as mom and dad, and then the scene kind of switches, and then he's in bed with Paul Meskel. So, but that was like one shot. So that's really the rare moment where the four of you were, yeah, we were together, together yeah, yeah. and it was bedlam. Trying it was to completely chaotic. I know it's kind of weird. For those of you who haven't seen the film, Jamie Bell is 10 years younger than me, and he's playing my father. So it's this beautiful, it's this beautiful idea. You don't want some weird thing to clap at. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, so that's what the, the premise of the, the film is: is this beautiful idea that um, what would you say if you could speak to your parents at the same age that you, more or less the same age that you are now? And it's, it's a beautiful cinematic sort of idea. So you have this grown man who's going in in ch children's pajamas to, to uh, you know, cuddle with his parents while, when, when he feels scared. And uh, it, sort of, uh, it sort of turns into this weird um, thing where his father turns into Paul Meskel. <laughs> Easy. Uh, Anna, Anna, so, um, so, 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 uh, wow. Uh, and, um, so, uh, yeah, it was just funny because we were in this 1980s uh, creaky bed and Paul had to sneak, uh, Jamie had to sneak out of the bed and become Paul and this rickety old bed and we had to have this very, very serious uh, sort of duologue, myself and Claire with that. So we just, it just, like, I don't know, it's what happens when you're doing um, uh, quite serious films is that you end up, you can't be serious all day, you know. You can't. You, you, it's like holding water. You know, it's you have to keep your imagination alive. As, so you, you you find yourself just hysterical the whole time because you can't just be. Um, you can't just be. You have to be ready. I always think in acting, you have to be particularly in sad movies. I always think in when you're playing something that's soulful. I think you have to be looking for the light, and I think when you're in comedy, you have to be looking for the soul. So I think you always have to be ready in a so-called sad film for. The, for lightness to happen, because I think if you took a snapshot of any human being on the worst day of their life, they wouldn't necessarily always be ashen-faced, because the beautiful thing about human beings is that we're, we try, you know, we try, we have, to, we have to eat lunch, and there's somebody who makes a joke, at a, you know what I mean, that we do that, we, we look towards the light, and I think what's so uh, beautiful about the film is that it's nuanced in that sense, it's, it, it understands that, um, we, you know, we contain multitudes on, a, on, any, on any given day. You know, you've had such a fantastic, varied career on stage, on film, on TV. I would love to know if you can put into words how this film has changed you, how it's changed you professionally, how it's changed you personally. Oh, well, uh, that's a lovely question. Um, it's, I'm just starting to, um, to, to process it, really, because it's, you know, a film like this, you know, I'm from uh, Ireland, and when I was 16, Hey! Uh, thank you. Hey! Uh, uh, so when I was 16, it was illegal to hold somebody's hand to walk down, down the street. So the, the fact that this film exists is completely miraculous to me. I went home, myself and Paul, who's also an Irishman, we went home to, and had the, 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 the Dublin premiere of it. And it was so emotional just to be able to, um, to be seen in that way. And um, it means a, an enormous amount. And, I think what's really, really moving about it, I think it's something that America was saying there about we think that there are films that are for particular types of people, but I like this movement towards this idea that you can see yourself in, in so many different types of cinematic and, and theatrical characters. And what I love is that people of all um, different walks of life have, have responded to the film. And I think what can be insidious as as a sort of minority is that you feel like you're only seen for just that, that just people see the label. And I think if we can just, in some ways, market our films and talk about our films in a way 
that uh, uh, is less cynical and just realize that actually uh, we can all see ourselves in completely opposing um, nationalities or genders. We can, our souls are, are, um, are such a distinct thing and uh, you know, you don't necessarily have to look like somebody um, in order to understand them deeply and, and that's, what, that's what the purpose of, of you know, dramatic art I think is, you know, so. Well, this film is going a long way for that. Congratulations. Andrew Scott, thank you so, thank much. You thank so you. much for being here. Thank you, so much. thank you. Stay put for a second. I know. All right, up next from May, December is Charles Melton. And before he comes out, let's take a look at a clip. Wow, how's it going? It's going good. Welcome to Santa Barbara. Great to see you. Thank you. Great to see you too. So, I will admit, this film was my introduction to you. I also was interested to learn that Todd Haynes, the director, he had not seen anything that you had been, if I, if I understand that correctly. So, were you aware when you were making May, December, that this was going to be a project that would be an introduction of you to new audiences? Uh, no, I wouldn't say so. I mean, I was, I was really uh, excited to, you know, I mean, to work with Todd Haynes and then knowing that Natalie Portman and Julian Moore were gonna be a part of the project. I mean, it was, I think more so just my whole thought process was I have to kind of prepare you know, like I've never prepared before in order to, you know, t tell this character's story and just leave it in the hands of Todd Haynes. When you think back on it now, are you kind of like, oh, I always knew I had a performance like this in me? Or did you surprise even yourself? Um, <laughs> no, I never thought I, you know, had this performance in me or anything like that, but... I was really just kind of like immersed in the whole process. I mean, we filmed it in 23 days and, uh, you know, there were my days where I was just like, oh, I'm so bad, you know? <laughs> like, this is not good, like I'm not good. But you know, just that's, I think that's like a part of it and just really focusing on the work and everything and just trusting in the, you know, the whole filmmaking process. And uh, yeah, I mean, that was like the gift. You know, you don't really think about being in an auditorium with all you lovely people at the end of the day, you know? But, uh, yeah. Would you say working with the likes of Julianne Moore and Natalie Portman was, was what you expected it would be like, or did it surprise you in ways that you didn't imagine? Oh, every day was a surprise. I mean, you know, I was really nervous going in just being so, I mean, it's Natalie Portman and Julianne Moore, and they're incredible. And I learned so much from them on the screen and off. And uh, I remember telling myself before I showed up to set, I was like, all right, Charles, just focus on the work. I, I know you want them to like you, but just focus on the work. <laughs> they might not be your friend, but that's okay. Just focus on the work. You're here to do a job. And it was just the complete, just, I was so surprised by um, just, you know, not only just, just the human beings that they are and, you know, they're, they've been so uh, guiding lights in my life, so it's been great. Okay, was there any part of you that was like, hold up, you want me to do these like super physical love scenes and you want me to gain 40 pounds? Like, really? <laughs> like, you can't ask me to do one or the other? <laughs> or What was that like when you heard about that? Uh... Uh, it was very professional when it came to the intimacy and everything. And I think, you know, Todd and I, we had a few, we had a few conversations about what Joe would feel like, not so much look like, and uh, it was fun for me. I mean, I got to eat whatever I wanted. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a lot of, you know, Sammy Birch's script and just like kind of diving into like this, 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 this character who, you know, had this adolescence taken from him at such a young age. 
and just kind of how that trauma and that experience would just like live in his body, you know, and just being a father of three, like his first kid he had when he was 13, you know. So I think, you know, he really doesn't have time to do a CrossFit class or anything, you know. He, <laughs> he uh, I feel like I, all you guys laughing, I feel like I just wanted, you know, say jokes up here. But, uh, no, but it, it, it was great, you know. A lot of those, the script really informed all those choices into the physicality of what Joe would really look like and how he would move and talk. One scene that I definitely just absolutely love is when you're sitting with the actor who plays your son on the roof. Gabriel Chong. I, God, I love that scene where you're, you're smoking and it's affecting you, right? Because it, it's new, it's a new experience. And it was just so natural, so convincing. Who, did you like ask people for advice? Like what's the best way to play high? Like how, what? <laughs> I don't know what it's like, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, that's funny. Uh, that day, it was, you know, I think we had half the day to film that scene. It was a very technical kind of shot, and there was harnesses and everything, and we were on this rooftop literally for like six hours. And I'm going to be honest with you, still to this day, I'm like, ah. I got one more take in me. Cause I was like in my head about that, you know, but I think cause you know, just focusing on Joe and where he was at, I mean, you kind of see him cracking from this shell, right? Where in a, in a sense, he, his son who's mirroring him mm. is kind of, we see the emotional maturity that his son has compared to himself. And so it was just very heartbreaking, you know, just kind of seeing this constraint and feeling for, Joe, but uh, yeah, I had to ask a lot of people what it was like to, you know, be high and stuff like that. It's like... One day you'll find out. <laughs> yes. And it, it's fascinating, the, the character of Joe, his hobby, for those of you who have not seen the movie, is kind of is handling and nurturing mm -hmm. butterflies. Yeah. I hope this isn't like the dumbest question of all time, but I mean, it, it, those were real. What was it like for you to handle them with, I mean, in as much as you handled the real ones? Wait, what? Were they real? Oh, yeah, 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 those were real. Right. Those, yeah, there was a, uh, a monarch butterfly handler, and she had a cage with all these monarch butterflies, and uh, she would put honey on my hand, and, you know, because monarch Butterflies love honey. Everyone knows this. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, it was very, um, very symbolic. It was very magical. I mean, kind of a spiritual experience for me, you know, letting the butterfly go. There was one butterfly that flew and then just fell down. Oh, no. <laughs> we didn't use that take, but then, you know, that, that, the butterfly ended up flying, you know, didn't make the cut, you know. <laughs> ah, sorry. <laughs> you know, when you think about this whole experience for you since <laughs> since the movie came out you've won the New York Film Critics Circle Award you've won the National Society of Film Critics Award you won a Gotham Award was there yes and also well deserved was there a moment since this movie came out that particularly blew your mind something that has happened to you in this whole experience I mean, I've met some of my heroes along the way, you know, and just having uh, intimate conversations with them. But really just all the people, uh, you know, during this circuit that I've been able to meet and just talk to and uh, just be so inspired by their work and, you know, talking to people backstage. They're watching me on TV right now, right? <laughs> no, but it's just been so incredible. I mean, like, you meet all these brilliant artists and to just kind of, you kind of feel like you're a team throughout this whole process, and uh, yeah, it's been really, I'm really grateful for that. I love it. Well, you made the most of it. You did such a great job. Charles Melton, everyone, thank you so much. Hang out there for a second. Someone will come get you in a minute. All right, up next is the fabulous Dave I Enjoy, Randolph. 
So let's watch a scene from her performance in The Holdovers. Hi, everybody. Hello. How's it going? It's going great. Good. So I read an article where you were talking about this whole last couple months and how crazy it's been. Yeah. You made a point of saying that like the end of the day going to bed for you has become like the sacred time and you have like a ritualistic way that you go to bed. Yes. I want to know what that's all about. It's watching you late at night. <laughs> On Turner Classic Movies. Last night I watched Notorious. Ooh, yeah. So good. Hitchcock in black and white. It was Absolutely. Whole... Yeah. So yeah. what do you do? You get all cozy. Take a really good hot shower, get little snacks, get my, you know, water, and then like I spray the pillows with the aromatherapy and all that good stuff. I pull out the iPad. I click on the icon, watch TCM. I scroll, 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 scroll. And I'm like, that one. And there you are. I love it. My favorite thing. It truly is. You just made my year. And next time <laughs> I do it, I'm going to go do a little deal Carol Burnett. Oh my God, I will lose it. Please do it. Okay, fine. Such a fan of you. Thank you. I'm a fan of yours. And, and as I said in, in an interview I did, I mean, I remember watching, I got to see The Holdovers in June, a couple months mm. before it premiered at the fest festivals, and I was like halfway through, I'm like, this woman is a virtuoso. Oh, like, I, we got to get her. You. So thank you for being here. Thank you. So for anyone who's not familiar with kind of the behind the scenes of The Holdovers, this is a movie that you shot over two years ago it was uh, uh, purchased at the Toronto Film Festival a year Secretly. and a half ago. Yes. Secretly. It wasn't like... Uh, I couldn't... I, I was at the Toronto Film Festival for another movie, and Alexander was like, I'm here. And I was like, well, can I come and see the movie? <laughs> nope. Wow. So people, like, buyers saw it, and I was just like, well, hope you like it. And the... The company that bought it, Focus Features, decided yeah. even though it's done and it's September, we're not going to put it out because we really want it to like make sure we can nurture it. So we're going to wait a whole other year. Yeah. What has it? What was it like for you to wait that whole extra year, knowing you had done this performance? Well, you know, um, Alexander has very good taste. It's funny you say this. We were shooting one of the last scenes, and it was us, like when we're all in the car driving around. So in order to make that happen. It would be me and Paul in the front and Alexander in the back, scrunched in the back because he really wanted to film it and having a camera and like getting the back view of us. And so it was super quiet. And the whole movie was really intimate. But that day in particular, <laughs> we were in between takes and I was like, I really look forward to eating pasta with you guys in Venice next year. And I was like, Alexander, all I want to do is be on a boat in Venice, stepping out, and it didn't happen. And I said, you know, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. No, but Focus Features has amazing taste. So when I found out it was Focus, I was like, oh, I, whatever y'all want to do, like they asked me, but, that, you know, <laughs> extremely good taste that I was like, they'll know, they'll know the right time. And then we got hit with a strike. But it was kind of perfect because the strike ended November 8th, and we release in theaters November 10th. Perfect. Yeah. It was a blessing in disguise. It happened the way it was meant to. Absolutely. So because I do work for TCM, I was really intrigued to learn that you, so Mary, the character, smokes. You do not. Do not, no. And you turn to Betty Davis to Betty teach you Davis, how to Sunset Boulevard. You know when she's sitting in her living room and she has her back towards the camera and she, it's like the... I don't know, the credenza. And she, he's like by the door, right? He's like, I'm leaving. And she's being really dramatic. And she just has the cigarette going. And it's just this smoke. And I was like, I want to make that happen. <laughs> um, so yeah, I really binged on TCM Heavy Heavy. Um, to You know, I, that was my smoking teachers. I love it. Mm-hmm. 
And then as people may be aware, it was important to you, Mary as a cook, in, in the, yeah. you wanted to cook, you wanted to actually cook. Yes. Did you get to like, I mean, the rest of whatever she was making was gonna be in the script. You didn't get to see. Yes and no. Uh, so uh, it just said like, she's cooking. So we were like, okay, let's do oatmeal. I don't suggest that. Because after many takes, oatmeal congeals, and that thing is like plaster. And then you're doing a take and you're like, Ugh, and it doesn't move. Uh, so I'll rethink that one next time. Um, we did oatmeal, we did soup, I made lunch for them, and then it was like the Sunday, uh, the Christmas dinner. And so Alexander and I came up with the menu, um, and we were lucky because the, the HBO series, Julia, yes. uh, was happening, or I think it like just finished. And so they have special um, prop people in particular for like food. So they were on that show. So they came on our show and I love to cook. So then I really got to like geek out with them. Um, and what was really cool is I was like, guys, can you please not eat today for the day that we shot the Christmas? Oh, right. Yeah, and I was like, I just, what if we just eat in real life on camera? And so we did, so we didn't eat that day. And then when they shot it, we ate a whole complete meal. Wow. And then at some point they said cut and we were still eating. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was dinner. So if, if I were to come over to your house, what would you cook for me? Ooh, what kind of stuff do you like? Anything you're gonna make. Mmm, I have a good roasted chicken recipe. I can really cook anything, but I love to ask my friends what they like. I like anything spicy. Ooh, okay. Then maybe I might do like a mole chicken and some rice and some grilled roasted vegetables. Like roast them first and then put them on the grill for the grill marks. Yes. Yum, right? I want all of that. And then some like street corn. That could be really fun. Okay, great. Come over. You name the day. Um, the character of Mary Lamb mm. is obviously very meaningful to anyone who's gone through loss or grief in their lives. Yeah. What have been some things that people have said to you once they've seen this movie and want to talk to you about it? Um, a lot of people have um, either written to me or messaged me. Um, the one, it's the most recent that I think really stands out. I was on a flight. Um, just a week ago, and I was sitting, and I, uh, first of all, uh, I'm like weird. I like watching people watch, I, I know, it's a little voyeuristic. I like watching people watch TV on airplanes. I do that. Let me finish that sentence. <laughs> I didn't finish it. I like watching people watch TV or whatever movie on airplanes. It's always fascinating to me. It's like this weird little game that I'm like, I wonder what they're gonna watch. And it always surprises me. There's also something I think, something very interesting about the being forced to be cut off from the world, so to speak, by being on a plane. Anyways, so I'm sitting here, the lady was one seat up, but on like the window seat, yeah. so I could see her clear shot to what she was watching. And she was watching the holdovers. And I was so nervous. <laughs> and I was like, does she like it? I don't know. <laughs> Um, and literally, I had to go to the bathroom, and I was like, no! And so I had to walk past her, and I, when I walked past her, she was like, <laughs> and I was like, no, no, no! I hope they're good tears. And then I went to the bathroom, and I came back, and I like, <laughs> like this, to walk back, and she was like, oh! <laughs> Isn't that weird? That's probably weird. You're like, in this little bubble, and then you're like, what the, oh! <laughs> But, so she came, she came, uh, like, I, I was like, oh, thank you, thank you. And I started walking past her, and she grabbed my arm, and she was like, nope. And so then I walked back, and she just hugged me, and I just hugged her. And it was so, I, that's, that's stuff you dream of. And she was like, she, it, which is crazy, she was like, my daughter, her grandson had just passed. No. And she was like, my, I know, she goes, you did too good of a job that I know my daughter is not going to be ready for this. But when she is, she said, I've seen it four times already. And I told her, this is going to be the thing that's going to help you. And I was like, what? But it's, it's, you can't. That's why you do it. 
That's, that's exactly why I do it. The movie yeah. came to life for her on the airplane. Yes. I love it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so Ava, much. Ava, enjoy Randolph. Thank you, everyone. Stay there for one sec. So much fun. All right, coming up next, the wonderful Greta Lee. So let's watch a scene from Past Lives. Hi. Welcome. Hi. So. I've been watching and, and just noticing this glass of water that's been it's here. It's new. And it's just checking to make sure it's hygienic, you know? I, I swear that a person comes and changes it out each time. Right. <laughs> Would you like a sip? <laughs> um, I know that this is a story you've told so many times, but I just really think it's so inspirational to Which hear it. Which story? Well, <laughs> the story of the fact that you originally did not get the part of Nora in Past Lives because it was meant to be a little bit younger, right? The Greta Celine's, Gerwig, Celine's, you mean? <laughs> um, what was that like for you to try to, knowing that at the time you weren't going to play this part that you had responded to, to kind of put it behind you and not keep thinking about it? And then what was the shock like when, you, when Celine came back to you? Okay, yeah. I mean, for... Um, <laughs> if you're not familiar with the story of how this, this incredible movie, if I may say so myself, that I love so much um, came into my life, it really does reflect sort of the tenets of the movie. I mean, I, I feel so firmly that I have Inyan with this movie. Um, Inyan, this thing that I had never thought about my whole life, I now can not, I can no longer unsee Inyan. Mm. I would like an Inyan break, actually. <laughs> <laughs> like, now we all, we all have Inyan, and it's too much. Right. There's too many of you. Um, it was one of those things, I got a script, um, and I had made a career of playing mostly supporting roles, um, and I had been working steadily for about 20 years and had been feeling very lucky to do so. And I got a script that just said, you know, subject line I, from, my, from one of my agents who's here, Houston, who said, you know, do you speak Korean? And I kind of thought, oh, yes. Um, and we went through the process. And basically, I didn't get the job. Um, and uh, there were uh, many turns of events, um, and, and a great one that includes uh, Greta Gerwig. <laughs> I got a call that I had assumed was for me regarding the movie and this big meeting, and it, and it ended up being a call for the other Greta, not Greta Garbo, but <laughs> for um, Greta Gerwig. But this is to say that um, it was so immediately clear that this script was so, um, it was so striking for so many reasons. It felt so uh, both small and urgent and necessary and like everything I had been searching for my whole life without even knowing that that's what it could be. Mm. Um, I had never expected that, um, given the world that we live in, that seems to support, uh, well, can I say, excess, or the loudest voice in the room, that maybe something like this, a quieter construct of, of love that we can all understand, would be a um, something worthy, uh, uh, this worthy in endeavor. Mm -hmm. And that is all because of Celine's song. My understanding is that in several situations, Celine's song went for 
really interesting realism on this shoot. If there were two characters that had never met each other before, the two guys, for instance, in the movie, she had them as actors not meet until they met while the cameras were rolling. Had you ever been in a production that did anything like that before? And what did that add to the equation for you? Yeah, I mean, we. what is incredible about the film is uh, the moment you see uh, Arthur and Hezong meet for the first time, that is actually the moment the two brilliant actors, Teo Yu and John Magaro, are actually meeting for the very first time. So there were some, I, I'll, I'll call them experiments, that were engineered um, in order to honor the spirit of this film. Um, um, you know, just about like a, a genuine and real depiction of what love can be and how it manifests for us um, in a in a very tangible way. It's the biology of love, of you know, of what that actually feels like, and it was um, challenging and sometimes annoying, and devastating, and uncomfortable, and embarrassing to to undergo. Um, but we, that's what we did, yeah. I was intrigued to learn that music was important to you on the set to kind of prepare and get in a vibe or a mood. Billie Eilish, for instance, I know you've spoken about listening to her specific songs. Uh, what, how did she help you? How did her music help you on this? Yes, hi, Billie. <laughs> You're never gonna see this, but um, she knows. Um, the thing about this movie, uh, one of many, it's this woman who is so, in a lot of ways, certain about her life and certain about what she wants out of her life. And that is the piece that felt so radical and central to the story that we were telling, that you could tell um, a love story and present, let's say, what could seem like a conventional love triangle through the lens of a woman who is not... Um, constructing her identity based on who she loves. Mm. That love is not uh, a choice that is right or wrong. That love can exist as its own construct that manifests in our lives for all of us, no matter who you are. And Billie Eilish helped me with that. She has this, she, her, um, she has this one song in particular about... Um, being in love with your future. I mean, this is a thing that I've carried with me uh, can, even now, this idea that you could, the greatest romance of your life could actually be the one that you have mm. with your own life. <laughs> one of the most beautiful and surprising things that I've learned about this film and you is that when your mom saw it, she said to you, I'm Nora. Was that a surprise to you when you heard that? Or were there things about her life and experience that you thought she would relate to? Yeah, that's, um, I, uh, she is a very mysterious woman <laughs> who I had never previously seen uh, cry before. Um, so that was a very special experience for me. Uh, she uh, saw the movie and she was very emotional and she said, you know, you think the movie is about you, but actually, I am Nora, <laughs> which I loved, so. Did you have questions for her after she said that? Many, <laughs> and she, many, and um, she answered them maybe, a, week later, when she was ready, you know, when she was ready. Oh my God. Okay, forgive me, but just because I love the morning show so much, which you're on, of course. What have your morning show friends, morning show cast members said when, when they saw past lives? They said, holy shit, Greta. <laughs> Yeah. Good answer. Yeah, that's what they said. Yeah. You, you, called, you called Nora the role of a lifetime. Why? I think that is something that I'm still trying to um, 
find the right words to explain. Um, mm. I think about certain moments in the film when um, Nora is sitting in a, a yellow cab driving into New York City mm. and the experience that I had of feeling the camera, 35 millimeter, on my face mm. for several seconds. And to you, that might be frivolous. But in that moment, understanding, I don't know the last time I've ever seen an Asian American woman on screen existing mm. for more mm. than several seconds. I'm, I'm glad this changed your life because it changed the lives of many people. Although I, I, I did notice that you did tell Andrew that no other movie had moved you more than his. <laughs> and, you know, I, we're not keeping, keeping score backstage, it's true. but we are. So, <laughs> and I just want to know, you know, like, so are you telling me that you didn't cry during past lives? Because, you know... You I was moved by past lives, but all of us strangers, I mean... It's gonna move the gay guy more. You're gonna have to forgive me. Always forgiven. Sure. I, I, I love you, Greta. It's so great to too. see you. Yes. Greta Lee, everybody. <laughs> Stay right there. <laughs> Sorry for anyone who's sitting there, but, but there's a screen. It's so great to have you here. Thank you. Lily, there's one question that often gets asked of people, and it, I hate it so much because I think it's total BS. And people say, well, where were you when you found out you got your Oscar nomination? And they're like, I was walking my dog. Bullshit. You knew exactly where, it, when the nominations were coming out. You were sitting by the TV or wherever. But your answer to where you were when the Oscar nominations were announced is beautiful. Where did you want to be knowing that that morning, January 23rd, was the nominations? I wanted to be as close to Molly Kyle as I could get. <laughs> um, I was on the Osage Reservation. I was in Pahuska. And, you know, it, it had been icy the day before, so it wasn't an easy drive to get out to Gray Horse. But, um, yeah, I was uh, in Osage County on Osage land. Away, <laughs> Majaje. <laughs> so, given that you were there that day, how did you then take advantage of that the rest of the day? What, what were you able to do because you were there? I just flew in this morning. <laughs> Thanks, I tried that out on America, out on the carpet. She was very gracious. Um, <laughs> I, um, I'm, just, I'm just here now. <laughs> you know, I, uh, it was a fairly quiet day. Um, I was on uh, FaceTime with my parents, which was great, because that was the other place that I would have wanted to be. Uh, I happened to be in Oklahoma that weekend anyway because I was I formed, you know, we formed wonderful friendships making this film. So I was in Oklahoma City watching Jason Isbell play. Um, he's a fantastic actor, Amazing. go figure. Yeah. And I figured, you know, I'll just stay in Oklahoma. Um, and it was always kind of a thought in the back of my head. I did also decide to be in Osage County um, when the film premiered in LA. Um, you know, that was during the strike, so we couldn't be there. And, um, yeah, I kind of figured it was really just that a whole group of Osage folks 
got to go take to the red carpet and got to speak first about the film because actors couldn't. So I went out to Grey Horse and I just um, paid my respects to the family then and uh, did the same, basically the same thing when, I, when the nomination came in, but you know, I felt like uh, a little tumultuous trying to, trying to get out there, so I didn't want to put my life in danger taking these icy roads, but <laughs> did uh, roll down to Osage Casino and have dinner and say hi to a few people. <laughs> um, a simple question, but one that I'd love to know the answer to. What does it mean to you to be the first ever Native American performer nominated for a Best Actress Academy Award? Thank you. It means I, um, well, one, get to highlight Native Indigenous designers, John Tacom. <laughs> it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a dual thing. It's long overdue. This is the 96th Academy Awards. Um, this industry film was originally founded. Some of the first filmmakers, some of the first film footage was shot by Native people documenting our way of life, and then it exploded. You know, it was like huge in the 1920s, and here we are in the 2020s. Things come in a little full, full circle, and people care about the stories that we're telling again. Um, but that's a lot of history and a lot of years of um, exclusion or misrepresentation. And I mean, Super Bowl's tomorrow. We haven't come that far if we look at one of the teams that's playing tomorrow. Um, <laughs> But, um, yeah, it's the thing that makes it, you know, it's, it's a lot to put on one person, but I don't look at it as mine. It's a circumstantial that it's this filmmaker, that it's this point in history, that it's this story, that it's this kind of an epic tale, that it's this character, that it's this community. I mean... The, um, the film is so remarkable because of how remarkable Osage people are and how much they had to say about the making of it, how embraced we all were. I'm so grateful that I get to share this historic nomination <laughs> with Scott, um, also a first Native American nominated in the category from Wajaje, from the Osage Nation, and that just makes it feel like that's right. You know, if I'm telling a story about Native people as an Osage character, it's only right that there also be an Osage or several Osage nominees. So. But yeah, it's, it's shared. That's ultimately what means the most to me. Is, um, I mean, the way that the response in Indian country from the Globes win, it's like, I'm, I'm done, <laughs> you know? It's... Um, it's very shared. It's, uh, it's very touching to see the impact that a win for one of us means for all of us. That's great. I was intrigued to learn that Martin Scorsese discovered you in Kelly Reichert's film, Certain Women, which you appeared with Laura Dern and Michelle Williams and Kristen Stewart. When you think back now to your experience making that movie, are you like, thank God I didn't know that Martin Scorsese was possibly gonna be judging me for another movie based on this performance? I actually remember sitting on the little, um, the little uh, AV, the little uh, rig that the dog, anybody who's seen that, the dog, the corgi would chase around. And I'm um, talking to our second AD after feeding the horses. <laughs> um, I mean, I remember reading that script just sheerly thinking, oh my God, this is a perfect film. Mm. This is a perfect character for me. I have to get this. And then I remember sitting on this ranch, on this, um, this four-wheeler, talking to our second AD, Keith, just like saying, I, ca I, don't, I can't describe it. I know my life has changed making this film, but I feel like there's something else. So it did, like I had this sense that there were going to be eyes on me that I wasn't ready for, you know. Um, I'd come from very small independent film, um, theater, I'd done several theater tours, 
It was uh, just getting to work at all that year and getting to tell that kind of story was immense. And I just, I don't know. I had, um, knowing the caliber of talent in that film, knowing how special, because, you know, you read, you read a script and you just see the film and you know how it's going to have an impact. And, yeah, I remember kind of bracing for that a little bit. Um, but, yeah, it was... Uh, <laughs> I, I guess I didn't realize that it had been in the works as long as it had, because I guess Marty had taken a pause to make The Irishman um, while developing Killers. And uh, yeah, I guess, I guess his eyes on me went back quite a ways. I love it. Given that the character of Molly so dominates the film, I was shocked to learn that there was a time where Molly had three scenes, I guess, when you first read it. I mean, Marty confirmed that in Q&As that we had, but when I first read it, I kind of thought maybe the sides that I'd gotten, as actors get used to seeing dummy sides, were maybe a lot of um, little curves are thrown into a scene to see how you can navigate them, or there's a lot condensed into it, or maybe it, the scene doesn't exist at all, but you're just trying to see the dynamics. But I remember feeling like these sides maybe were a little bit more developed than dummy sides. But Molly had like almost a half page long monologue where she lists all of her sisters, she lists a couple of murders, um, then Ernest says something charming and she's kind of drawn back in and then you get like a little bit more information that he drops about his family and it was like, oh, these feel like tertiary characters. <laughs> and um, I was kind of, they were hard to perform. So when I submitted the audition, I didn't really feel that great about it, not hearing about it. I assumed that was what it was. But turns out, the script was getting this huge overhaul. And Marty did confirm later that there were about three scenes developed between Molly and Ernest and all of that, and the story that had focused on the FBI. But um, yeah, everybody, you know, it's, it's tempting to want to point to one person who said, we need to change this. But what's so refreshing is that it seemed collectively everybody came to the same conclusion that part of the story needed to be with these two characters. Mm. And consequently, that brings the Osage Reign of Terror, <laughs> it brings Osage characters to the center of that in a way that, you know, we already have the FBI story that was FBI propaganda with Jimmy Stewart. We didn't need another one. Well, I'm so glad that, yeah. I'm so glad that the character of Molly grew, and I'm so glad that you played her. And it's a thrill to be with you. Lily Gladstone. Thank you so much. Okay, now before I bring all six of our phenomenal honorees out for a group interview, we have another montage of some of their work to take a look at. Check it out. Anywhere you want. Come sit with me. I hope so. Hi, everybody. Oh, yes, Greta with the wine. You, you, good. Andrew, too. I want one. <laughs> A Diet Coke, please. Yeah. It's like I love... we're on Graham Norton. <laughs> well, speaking of Graham Norton, I just saw Davine and Andrew on Graham Norton together. We did that. Greta and Andrew, you did variety actors on actors together. Davine, you've spoken publicly about how much you love past lives. And Charlie. Well, yes. <laughs> and past lives. Right. <laughs> Lily and Charlie. Lily and Greta, you guys did the Hollywood Reporter Roundtable together. It's just fun to have to see all of these different connections. I want to know, we, we heard about Greta and Lily in these roles where they are speaking languages other than English, Korean and Osage. I want to know what other languages you all would like to learn or speak in a future project. America? Well, I speak Spanish. Um, gracias. Um, I, I love you too. Um, I grew up in a Spanish speaking household, but, um, because we're, I'm first generation immigrant, we were like taught to assimilate and that meant like first and foremost, no English. Um, but 
So we no English to assimilate. We were for, we were pushed to assimilate, and so you know my parents thought maybe they'd be like, you know, um, holding us back or keeping us from being successful if like we spoke Spanish instead of English. But the amazing thing about kids is they they can learn everything at the same time, and we grew up um, speak, uh, hearing Spanish in the household, but answering in English. Any other? Immigrant kids have that experience. Um, yeah. And so I speak Spanish, but I always have like hesitation around it because it, it's not like, you know, I didn't practice it enough. So I would love the challenge of actually acting in Spanish, I think would be terrifying for me and it would be really fun too. Oh, I can't wait till you do it. Yeah. Lily, any other languages that you want to brush up on? And do you want film? I mean, it's happened several times now that I've spoken indigenous languages that are not mine. And I think to a lot of people who know very little about us and make us a bit of a monolith, there's this idea there's a Native American language. There's uh, 574 federally recognized tribes in this country and another several hundred that are not high California Indians. Um, <laughs> but uh, we all have very different languages, different dialects, and it's kind of ironic, or I don't even want to call it sad, because it's language of idolization, and performance is a beautiful way to do that. Um, but I speak Osage better than I speak Blackfeet. So it would be incredible to have the kind of resources that were there to pick up Osage. By the end of the summer, I was constructing sentences on my own. Wow. Um, which was really helpful for some of the improv that I wanted to do. But, and you know, it's, it's left me now, but if I hadn't gone into performance, if I hadn't started getting cast in theater roles, one of my postgraduate interests was to develop a pedagogy that's performance-based for language revitalization of indigenous language. And getting to do so, <laughs> you know, not getting to do so in an academic sense and developing these methods, there's still, um, you know, getting to actually practice it as an actor with these characters and seeing how, okay, I was right. When you can express emotion in a language, you're more likely to remember it. Mm. You're more likely to use it. Um, so, yeah, I would love to have a chance to pick up Blackfeet as well as, as was able to crack into Osage making this film. Greta, what about you? What else do you want to speak? Um, Honestly, after past lives and what that required, I'm good in English. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, Charles, I'm excited for I'm excited for Charles to maybe tap into your Korean and you know get into that side of things. I just only know all the uh, so I'm first generation on my mom's side, and in the household, uh, my mom, you know, I, I know every bad word. In <laughs> like, I'm A++ when it comes to <laughs> Korean profanity. But I would love to speak Korean, obviously. Uh, I, I'm semi-okay. And, um, Majo? Yeah, <laughs> and, I, and German. German would be great, because I lived in Germany for four years. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. I studied German in college. Really? You want to do a movie together in German? <gasps> yeah. 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 Das ist sehr gut. <laughs> Dave, I'm, what, are you, what language are you going to speak in your next movie? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Why y'all laughing? <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna hit y'all with this. So I'm a classically trained opera singer, and in studying, thank you. And <laughs> do you hear what my voice sounds like now? <laughs> I'm hoarse. Um, uh, but when you when you study it, you must learn all the romance languages and German. So I secretly want to do a project where I'm playing an opera singer, 
and then I want it to be international and I'm traveling all over the world and I'm in Paris, and I'm over here and bonjour, and, oh, you know, just yeah. every time in the movie where it's like Rome and like bonjour, you know, you know? <laughs> I want to just knock them all out. Works for me. I want to see it now. Andrew, what's yours? What, what's your next one? Your next language? Such a terrifying question. Um, well, we have to speak Irish, you know, Gaelic. You know, I, I, Irish people have... That was a pathetic <laughs> attempt of support from the Irish contingent. No, we, have to, we, we, we have to learn Irish. Uh, it's compulsory to learn what uh, people call Gaelic, but we call Irish in, in, um, in Ireland. Um, but, uh, yeah, we just had this beautiful movie called On Colleen Keane, which was Oscar-nominated last year. So I hope there m more of those um, um, Irish language films get, 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 get recognized. Um, but, yeah, I just want to speak the language of love. Aww. <laughs> Like. So we, we learned tonight that Billie Eilish was kind of Greta's musical spirit animal during past lives. For any of the rest of you, was there a specific soundtrack that helped with the performance? America? Um, can I think about it? Does anyone sure. else have a... Lily, were you, who were you listening to? I mean, we put on things that would have been on the radio at the time. And there's really, honestly, not that many 1920s uh, um, folks that are on Spotify. Um, <laughs> I, um, I always listen to Zoe Keating for any character. Um, I think that's the dance background is like, you wanna stay in a subconscious space. Um, but, you know, rest in peace, I, I also, like, Listen to Robbie Robertson. Great. Yep. Charles, what, what were you listening to during May, December? Anything? Well, obviously, Todd had that cool yeah. music from, from the go between. Yeah, he would play that uh, in between setups and just set up the vibe for yeah. each scene. I was like, oh, okay. Um, yeah, music. I mean, I listened to a bunch of Radiohead. Yeah. And some Nirvana. Everything in the right place uh, from the Kid A album was like my go-to, and something in the way uh, with Nirvana. Nice. Hey, mind what were you listening to during the holdovers? Um, I would listen to when I got picked up. I would have them turn on, like, uh, you know, like Aretha Frank, like, like you said, like music of the time. And then when I went home, I was like play that 2022 stuff. Because I needed that transition. You know what I mean? I needed, I needed the transition from the moment that I was in the car to be like, okay, we're going to this place. And then when we would rap for the day, I'd be like, blast it. Because I needed, that. that was like part of my like beginning to lift, you know, from her, that I needed that like off of me. I mean, Andrew Haig basically rated, it's as if he rated my music collection during right. all of his, yeah, House Martins and yeah. Alison Moyet and all Brazier that. and... Yeah, yeah there was so, there's so many sort of gay, gay classics. I always find that so interesting, actually, about, about, uh, about music, that you understand something about music when you're a little gay kid. I remember hearing, um, I remember hearing I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor when I was about nine. And I had no, I just remember thinking, this song is for me. <laughs> and I didn't know, I didn't know anything about myself, but you just understand something, something is able to, you know, it's not about your sexuality or anything. It's more about your identity. So to be able to have all those songs that I was, the Pet Shop Boys were a huge, huge influence on me, and they're, 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 it's used so brilliantly in the movie. Yeah. So yeah, music has that power. Really, to, really, it's so brilliant for actors for us to be able to just get to something really immediately. You know, like in the car on the way, and it just yeah. helps to get there. America, do you have an answer now or no? You don't the, have the to. The true answer is that I'm just always listening to whatever my kids want to listen to. And at the time, my son's favorite song was Daddy Yankee's Dame Mas Gasolina. So that's probably was at the top of my Spotify playlist when I was making Barbie. And I hope you can feel that in my performance. <laughs> that's, that's what was going on. Okay, so Andrew spoke earlier about working with Paul Meskel, and anyone who's seen the movie knows that they've got great chemistry together. America, who is a performer out there that you know you would have great chemistry with? I think anyone on this panel. I would be, 
I am honored to sit on this stage with these incredible actors, and I would be honored to work alongside you. Great answer. Anyone. anyone else want to add to that? Who, who, who do you know you would... No one who's here currently. <laughs> Dave, I'm going to let Charlie answer that. <laughs> Go ahead, Charlie. <laughs> Dave, I'm. Thank you. <laughs> Good answer. No, um, really, everyone here. Right. Earlier, I was okay. asking. Except was asking, Greta. I was asking Greta about response from the cast of The Morning Show to her role, has there been anyone in any of your cases that you loved or admired that said something to you about these current roles that just blew your mind? And what was it? And what, who would they say? I don't know that I'm ready to talk about it. Um, I'm not ready to talk about what he, what he said, but um, I guess whenever anyone like asked me like, who were the you know, Latino actors you grew up wanting to be, I'd say, Tom Hanks. Like, I, I wanted to be Tom Hanks more than any other actor. And I did. Like, he's, he's every man. He's like, we all see ourselves in him, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he, oh man, I'm not gonna cry. Um, he came up to me at an event and he said very nice things to me and it's I'm still recovering from it And that was that was truly like the moment where I felt like what you said like, okay I'm happy like I can tap out now Tom Hanks just said nice things to me. So Lily I'm glad it's on video Because <laughs> I wouldn't believe it um, Since I kind of wanted to act in film. My queen has been Kate Blanchett. And um, <laughs> she still is. Um, I just kind of saw what was possible um, with what she was able to calibrate with each performance anyway. But um, she introduced the film in London and when she introduced us, <laughs> um, me and Leo, I just kind of said quietly to the audience, Kate Blanchett's my favorite actress. <laughs> and they just went, well, you're my favorite actress too. Oh my <laughs> no, 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 no. Amazing. No, 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 no. <laughs> Very gracious of her. Thank you, Kate. Greta, anyone besides the cast of The Morning Show that you would? It's no, okay. I, I mean, you just said Kate Blanchett. I was going to be like my brother. <laughs> Counts? He was like, I sort of got the chills. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I, I think I, I can share the sentiment that I know that we all have experienced this ridiculous outpouring of love, this um, unique and unnatural situation when you get to hear from peers and idols and. I mean, I, I, I don't want to brag, but like everyone from like Nicolas Cage to like J-Lo and to Guillermo del Toro, <laughs> no big deal. Um, it, it, it has been unreal. Love I mean, I, 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 I told J-Lo, she said, I saw your movie, this is your moment. <laughs> and then you know what I said? I just said, I wub you, J Wo. <laughs> <laughs> and she kind of politely waited for more, and I went. <laughs> That's okay. No, it's not okay. <laughs> Charles? Memorable feedback from someone you'd love and admire? Uh, uh, there's just so many. <laughs> <laughs> there's a ton of them. No, 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 no. Uh, no it's, um, 
I probably. <laughs> God, it's just so tough. <laughs> no. Uh, no, no, no. For me, um, it was uh, Joaquin Phoenix. Whoa. He got what it. What did he say? <laughs> I'll tell you later. All right, fine. Okay, text me. Dave, I'm, how about the only murders people? What have they said? You knew that's exactly who I was going to. Meryl Streep! Oh. Boom! Yeah. Yeah. What'd she say? It was weird because she was like really quiet. And I was like, wait, what? Because I wanted to like hear everything. And she was like, it was subtle, it was soft. It felt like I was in Devil Wears Prada, like I was shaking inside <laughs> for her review. And it was just like, you know, like, you know how that character like took their time, like, blue, I like it, mm -hmm. So I was like, ah, ah. Um, but yeah, she dug it. Andrew? For me, it was, it was at the Golden Globes and I met Jodie Foster. <gasps> and I said, um, I love you, Jodie Foster. <laughs> 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 oh, that's savage. No, no, she was incredibly sorry. She was incredibly great, great. She's wonderful. I love it. Okay, so my my tradition at the Virtuosos is to end the night with the same question to everybody, and I've given most, if not all, of you warning, which is I want us all to recommend a film, a recent film, maybe from this year, this season, that maybe some people in this audience might not have seen that you would recommend to people. And this is not patronizing or pandering to say this in front of Lily, but mine, because I'm gonna start off while you're thinking, mine is a movie called The Unknown Country, which is a movie that Lily is in. I saw it on an airplane, like your friend saw yours on the airplane, and I don't, I think it's rentable. You're actually credited with the story, co-writing the story and acting in it, and it's a beautiful, beautiful movie. If you like Nomadland, you will love the Unknown Country. So Thank that's you. that's my recommendation. Daniel Day-Lewis also loves that movie too, go figure. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm going to start with Andrew Scott and come all the way back to you. Um, well, the movie that springs to mind is, that people have probably seen actually, but it's a movie called Passages. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's an Irish sax mo movie. Ben Wishaw. So, so wonderful. And uh, it's really brave and weird and just fantastic. It's sort of it's strange, actually, because you, you, you emerge into this thing where certain films are selected for prizes. And that's really cool. But, like, it is really not genuinely why people do it. And it doesn't mean that these films are, because they're not being given prizes, are any less... Uh, significant in people's lives and just these little tiny films that are made are, are sometimes the ones that are hold the, the dearest pl places in people's hearts you know where the ones where you discover themselves and so uh, even though people think um, you know people love passages it's a film that I absolutely adore so that's that's one great choice yeah. Dave Ayn. well I have to be honest we've all been very busy and on planes and stuff and so I haven't and then I'm just watching you when I am watching something. Um, I, I looked and I had an answer, but then I looked and it came out in 2022. Who cares? Um, Triangle of Sadness. Wow, well, amazing. Yeah. It's riveting. So good. It's really, really riveting. It's really intelligent. Yeah. And I, and I love how the camera just lingers and stays on everyone in a very awkward, long way, which I think then all the beauty in the gems like when you think it's like, oh, there it is, it keeps going, and I, and I just thought it was beautifully shot. Charles. Can I go last? <laughs> yes. Greta. I, oh. Well, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of movies I still want to see. You said from this year, yes? Or just something recent that you would oh, recommend. Uh, 
I mean, I, I need to go last. No problem. Okay, Retta, are you I'll ready go. to order? Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> this is like we're at a restaurant, and we'll give you time to figure out what you want to order off the menu. I need pictures. I need pictures on the menu. Okay, I, I know. Uh, for me, it is A.V. Rockwell's 1001. Oh, yep. That is a movie that premiered alongside pa Past Lives at Sundance uh, almost a year ago exactly. And there are certain performances that really feel like acts of service. And if you are an actor, you know what that means. And Tiana Taylor, my God, my God, that performance. Um, so you got to see it. And based on the response, it feels like not a lot of people have. you got to see that movie. Yeah, really They're gonna thousand and one. It. It's probably on Peacock now because it's a Focus Features movie. So it's probably on Peacock. Lily, do you have one? do. It's on Netflix by um, it's first time narrative filmmaker, but a long time doc filmmaker. And his docs have always been so charming and illuminating. And the narrative's the same. Um, Billy Luther's Fry Bread Face of Me. It's on. It's, um, yeah, it's just native excellence at its most excellent. It's um, just beautiful kids, beautiful storytelling, beautiful established actors. Um, yeah. Say the title again. Fry Bread, Face, and Me. Okay. By Billy Luther. America. And now I have five of them, I want to say, because I've had too much time. But I, I'll, I'll pick one, which is um, uh, Eva Longoria's Flaming Hot. Flaming Hot. If you haven't seen it yet, it's on Hulu, I believe. Um, was that wrong? Am I wrong? No, it's Oh, I'm right. It's Hulu. Um, it's Eva's feature directorial debut. I think she does a phenomenal job. So much style in telling um, a, a story that is about a, a, just a very smart man who's, who, um, it's, a, it's about the Flaming Hot, the guy who created the Flaming Hot Cheetos. Um, oh, I love that movie. Yeah, right? That's a good and, movie. And that I really would say, uh, Jesse Garcia, the, the lead, gives a stunning performance, like a, a performance, career-defining performance, and one that made me so emotional to see uh, a, a Latino actor who's been doing it for 20 years finally get a chance to really sink his teeth into um, a role that was worthy of the extent of his talent. And so don't miss it because it, the whole movie is beautiful. Eva did an incredible job and Jesse's performance is just unreal and should not go unnoticed. So enjoy it if you haven't already. Thank you. Yeah. Got one? I think I got it. Okay. Uh, I was thinking what Greta said, a thousand and one. one. And uh, that was a great film. Uh, I really enjoyed that. But one other film that I haven't seen yet, but I feel like it's going to be incredible, is Monster. I can't, yeah, I haven't seen that yet. But uh, it came out, I think, at Cannes last year. And that's just something I want to see. All right. Um, thank you for all the recommendations. That's quite all right. These are good ones, and I haven't seen most of the ones that you even talked about. Okay, so now I have the pleasure of bringing out someone who's gonna help me present the actual Virtuoso Awards to all of you. She's someone who's local here in Santa Barbara. She's beloved by so many people. And oh yeah, she has five Emmys. Please welcome the fabulous Jane Lynch. Thank you. Well, rounding out our evening of diversity, we have a big white lesbian. <laughs> Thank you. Represent. We have a lot of students out here tonight. We have middle school students. We have our local um, high school students. We have some college co-eds. And um, I was talking to them on the press line. And they were t asking me about acting. And I said, you're going to learn about acting. In fact, you're going to have a master class in acting tonight. And I think that's exactly what we all got to enjoy with the, these wonderful actors. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, allow me to present to you the recipients of the Santa Barbara International Film Festival's Virtuoso Award for this year of our Lord, 2024. <laughs> From Barbie, America Ferrera. <laughs> Lily Gladstone. From Past Lives, Greta Lee. May, December, Charles Melton. From the Holdovers, Davine Joy Randolph. All of us strangers, we have Andrew Scott. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you, Jane. Thank you to our wonderful honorees tonight. And thank you all for being here. This was thank such you, a special everybody. night. My pleasure. Have a great night, everybody.